the voice has spoken, the recording's in progress, and uh, I'm going to talk us a little bit about the Lower Nehalem Watershed Council. Um, so we're an organization dedicated to the protection, preservation, and enhancement of the Nehalem Watershed through leadership, cooperation, and education, and that's, that's our mission statement. Um, we're located here on the Oregon coast. Um, the Lower Nehalem is all of the North Fork Nehalem River, and then the main stem Nehalem all the way up to Humbug Creek, which is right there. Um, so that also includes all the Salmonberry River. Uh, and we're split with the upper Nehalem that is Humbug Creek and all of its tributaries north. And then you can actually see the Nehalem River loops back around and almost meets up with the headwaters of the Salmonberry River over here. So it's kind of a funny shape. Um, anyway, what we do is we work with landowners, private companies, local state federal agencies, and pretty much any other stakeholder or stakeholder group to enhance habitat for fish and wildlife. Uh, we do this through research, fish passage projects, riparian plantings, in-stream enhancement, and wetland restoration. And we also do it through a, a variety of different outreach efforts, including um, our upcoming Nehalem Estuary cleanup on March 5th. You can contact me to find out how to get involved, as well as this speaker series and our Explore Nature uh, hikes, which will be starting back up again this summer. Um, I just wanted to talk quickly about something we did last year. Uh, this is a project that is now complete and we're pretty happy with what we did here because it's a pretty neat little piece. So it's the Grand Rapids Creek Habitat Enhancement. It's an in-stream enhancement project. Um, so down here is Nehalem Bay, right? And Grand Rapids Creek is a tributary to the North Fork Nehalem all the way up here uh, off the Little North Fork. So almost all the way up to Highway 26. And so this is a whole bunch of information, but pretty much what you need to know is that the gradient was, isn't too awfully steep, but that the sediment tends to be mostly cobble and gravel dominant. So it's a little to the big side. You want kind of a, do, a dominant gravel uh, stream bed for coho spawning and for steelhead spawning. Um, but it's a pretty good stream for fish habitat already. Um, and it just kind of was lacking large wood and, and beaver dams in the area. And so we applied for a grant to OWEB to uh, do some in-stream enhancement. And part of that was the installation of beaver dam analogs. And beaver dam analogs are a structure that help to store winter water and back water up during high flows. Um, they also increase that pool area that's accessible for salmonids, as well as amphibians and other wildlife that utilize stream pools like that. And they help to sort gravels and trap and store nutrients and sediments and improve the uh, diversity of the in-stream habitat. And um, they're made by installing these posts through the river or through the stream. And they're driven down into the stream bed and then woven in with branches to simulate a beaver dam and create habitat that can attract beavers to colonize either that location or nearby. Um, so this project was focused on doing both large wood structures and beaver dam analogs into the stream. Um, so here's a couple of sites just to kind of give you an idea of what it looked like before. Note this big tree that's in both pictures. But you see there's not a lot of wood in the stream and it's all uh, hardwood, it's all alders that are in the stream and alders break down really quickly. There's a conifer log way up here, um, but conifer logs are what you really ha have high value as in-stream habitat because they last a long time, they rot really slowly. And so they're able to create impacts on the stream for a longer period of time. Um, so this is after the project is done. You can see here's that big tree once again. And there was a timber harvest nearby that Greenwood did. And so they donated a bunch of conifer trees for us to make big dams or big log jams uh, in, the, in the stream. And that'll back up and sort gravel and create a lot of really great habitat. 
Um, here's an upstream view of that same location, that big tree that we were talking about is this right here on the left-hand side. And you can see that, that the logs are right in the stream bed and they're gonna really activate and uh, interact with waters when they come up to help again, sort gravels back water up over the floodplain, improve that nutrient exchange and, and do a lot of work um, really creating uh, diversity in the stream bed habitat and in the stream habitat here. Uh, and this location is one where we put in one of the beaver dam analogs. And, you know, keep in mind this, this little smaller cedar right here, because you'll see it again. Um, and it's actually right here. And I know that this looks a lot like a mess, right? But if you take a look at it, there's a series of posts over here interwoven with branches. Another series of posts over here all the way on the right. And then there's a series of posts over here on the left that also is woven in with branches and all this debris, some of it is actually put in here, um, some of it to attract beavers as potential forage. Um, and some of it's also just there to back up against these beaver dam analogs to create a large pooled area of activated floodplain for nutrient exchange and to provide good rearing habitat for uh, coho salmon as they come up Grand Rapids Creek. So here's a close up again of one of those beaver dam analogs. And you'll note that it's not necessarily right in the stream bed right here, but in fact, they go up onto the bank a little ways to make sure that, they, that you create and take advantage of the whole potentially pooled area that, that you, can, you can make through this. Um, it's a pretty neat technique that isn't getting used uh, a ton yet on, on the coast range but we're hoping that we can see some good impacts in our monitoring of this and that it'll, uh, it'll create some, some good, some good uh, fish benefit. Um, so that's my big old ramble. If you're interested in the Watershed Council, feel free to reach out to me. Um, lnwc at nehalemtel.net is our email address. Um, and we're always happy to talk about potential projects and the like. Um, and so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Jose Marin Yaren, or Haran, um, who is a fisheries professor down at, um, well, it was formerly Humboldt State University, and did his graduate work up here in Oregon at uh, OSU, focused on some of the work that he's going to talk about tonight. And so... Um, I guess I'll stop rambling and pass it over if you like. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And, and please call me Jose. Um, Jose, great. Yeah. So I'll just share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So like Zach was saying, this is work that um, I actually started as a master's student um, at University of Oregon uh, with Alan Shanks, which is the last author on this slide. Um, and then I continued on as a PhD student with uh, Dr. Jessica Miller at Oregon State University. Um, and she's based out of the Hatfield Marine Science Center. And so that's why I have all the logos. Um, and we used to be Humboldt State University. We just changed names to California Polytechnic um, University at Humboldt, is what, or Cal Poly Humboldt is what we're going by now. So um, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so a little bit of background on why we should study sandy beaches, why they're important, um, and why we should conserve them. Um, so many, I'm sure all of you have been to a sandy beach, right? They're fairly abundant and common, right? They uh, make up at least 50% of all of the world's coastlines. And that percentage goes uh, up a fair amount in the Pacific Northwest. We're thinking between 60 and 70% of all of our coastline are sandy beaches. Um, these environments are very interesting, right? Um, and they extend from the shoreline to the outermost breaker, right? Um, on many of our beaches, we have more than one breakers. 
Um, and some, we only have one breaker. So however uh, far out they go, that's what the surf zone um, includes. Um, and originally it was thought of as a semi-enclosed environment. It's a little more complex than that. The water that comes in is actually constantly flushing in and out. So it's, it's open to the water that's coming in, but it's semi-enclosed to the organisms. And I'll explain why in a second. Um, besides being extremely pretty, right, and important for, for us for, for um, walking and doing all kinds of activities, they're really important for many fish species, some of which are of commercial value, like Chinook salmon, um, which is why we're here to talk about. Um, and the fish species come because there's a lot of food, there's a lot of little inverts that come here, that, are, that live here, right, and they're able to eat, and because of the turbulence, right, it's so uh, turbulent, the water is so turbid, uh, there's shelter from predators, or at least that's we, what we thought, right? If you're a diving bird, you don't want to dive into these waters. You can't see the bottom. You don't know if you're going to hit the bottom. So it's, it's pretty dangerous for you. And then besides being um, a habitat for these uh, fish, they have other ecosystem services. They are able to cycle nutrients right through the invertebrates that are there. Um, the, the fish that live there then go out of the surf zone and serve as food for larger predators. Um, the sediment is able to filter the water um, and they serve as nursery habitat for both fish and invertebrates. So this is a uh, diagram that's commonly used and let me see if I can switch my, um, can you see my laser pointer? Awesome. So this is the shoreline, the beach, right where we walk on. Um, and so what happens is in many of the beaches on our coast, the water comes in through these regions right here um, and here. And of course, if water comes in, it has to go out somewhere, right? It can't just keep piling sky high. And so what happens is that this water that's coming in turns sideways par uh, parallel to the beach um, on what are referred to as longshore currents. So if you ever walk out, if you're a surfer or um, a fisher, right? If you might like to go for surf perch, for example, you might have felt a pull on your on your feet, on your legs sideways, not back and forth, right? Those are the longshore currents that are moving the water sideways to what are referred to as rip currents, where the water goes offshore, right? That's why we always tell people that are swimming that if you're caught in the rip current, not to swim against it, but to swim sideways, right? So that you swim out of the rip current towards these return flow and the water will push you on shore again. So this is what surf zones, how surf zones work, right? Um, and so water is continuously moving in sideways and then out. Um, and so it's an open, open system, but um, this movement uh, in a circle forms what are we refer to as cells, which allows the trapping of things like phytoplankton, um, which is why you might have seen a lot of foam in the surf zone, for example, right? That tends to be captured. Um, and that it, it's also able to capture zooplankton and, and, and larger organisms. So um, there's a bit about of work that Alan has done, um, especially in, in Central and Southern California, where he has found that the plant, planters that he catches here are much more abundant than what they find out here in the outer surf zone or in the um, open ocean. So it's this open to the water, but semi-enclosed to the organisms. Um, and I forgot to mention, if anything is not clear or if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to stop me um, and ask questions. So these are just a few pictures that uh, came out in a, in a summary um, of things that occur or organisms that occur or, um, or the reasons why sandy beaches are important, right? Um, one of the things we always thought was that big fish would not come in. In fact, many chondricti, so sharks, rays, skates, are fairly common here. Um, down here in California, for example, we often find leopard sharks that are swimming in and out, bat rays. Um, we also run into the occasional otter, the river otter that, that are, are curious about what we're doing and seals, of course, as you may have noticed, seals and sea lions. Besides the big fish, there's also lots of smaller fish. Um, the, the numbers can be very abundant and that attracts, of course, a lot of fishing, as you can see in C and D, right? Some of it uh, recreational, and in many places it's it's commercial fishing. Um, for example, in Ecuador, where, where I'm from, um, there's a fair amount of, of commercial fishing um, off of our sandy beaches. And as we all know, right, the beauty of the sandy beach and the surf zones attracts a lot of people, not just for tourism, but to live. Um, 
So development is a huge part of, of, of Sandy Beach and surf zone management and conservation. And this, um, this need for space for people to live, right, has led to a fair amount of development, um, not just to, um, to protect the, the buildings behind it, right, but the beach itself where um, because of how we've modified the shoreline, um, sand is, is sometimes scarce. So we either have to add it um, uh, or move it around um, as necessary. Uh, sandy beaches are, you can classify and fly them in many ways. What, uh, a lot of uh, sandy beach uh, ecologists like myself uh, like to think of them is as we classify them depending on how the wave, uh, the wave energy is used up. And this has this and it leads us to a gradient that goes from what are referred to as reflective to dissipative beaches. So reflective beaches, and, and this is a gradient, right? I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the end, so to speak, but you get the point. There's, there's a fair amount of them in the middle. The reflective beaches are very steep beaches um, that have a very steep slope. Um, in this case, the energy of the, of the wave, the wave makes it all the way to the shoreline, crashes against the shoreline, and basically the energy bounces back. So it's reflected off the shoreline. Because of this, they only have one breaker. Um, the sand is very coarse, and the water doesn't go just doesn't just move above the sediment. It's also able to go into the sediment, right, because of that coarse grain, and then move underneath it back out. The opposite side are dissipative beaches, and these are more common in central and southern and northern Oregon. Excuse me. Um, this is where the energy is dissipated. These have flatter beaches, right? So they tend to be very wide surf zones. They have more than one breaker. Uh, surfers love this, right? Um, you paddle out um, and catch the ones, the breakers on the outside. Um, and they have very fine sand. So instead of the water being able to go deep into the sediment, right? They're not able to, the fine sediment stops it. And so the water is circling um, uh, uh, and, and staying above the sediment line. Besides types of beaches, we have several other uh, factors to consider. The other, a second one is that on our beaches, sand moves. And you may have noticed this in the summer, right? We have what are called sandbars um, and they come on shore. We have between four and six sandbars that make it on shore every summer. So this is just a few diagrams that hopefully explain what that means. And I apologize, they're a little grainy, but this is a, an oldie but goodie paper that we like to cite. So this is the beach where we walk, right? Um, this is the first area where the, the, the nearest breaker is. In between this breaker and the outer breaker are what are referred to as troughs. So um, these are underneath these breakers, it's shallower. That's why the wave breaks, right? So these are the sandbars out here. And so in between is a trough. So this is water where the, it's much deeper than on the outer breaker zone. So that's why the wave breaks out here on the outer breaker zone, does not break in the trough, right? Because it becomes deeper and then breaks over here again because it's again shallower. So it's a trough or runnel that's often referred to. So during the summer, there are smaller waves, right? And this small wave allows for sand to be pushed on shore, but then not be, they're not big enough to pull the sand away from shore. So as these, the summer progresses, the sandbar comes closer to shore. So now you have this, the bar here, the trough in the middle, and the sediment, the, the sand, the shoreline here. That sandbar continues to move closer and closer um, until it welds to the shoreline. And so you may have incur, in, uh, encountered this, right? You may have been walking across here and all of a sudden you almost fall into a, a hole, a pool, what we used to call. Um, and that's because you can see the sandbar has now welded to the shoreline in certain parts, but not in others. They get finger-like structures is what they call them. This, um, besides affecting um, where waves break, it also affects circulation, right? Because uh, water circulates here in a circle. Um, and so things can get concentrated. Think of little plankton, right? So good food for fish. It's also deeper, right? So the fish like that because they feel safer. Um, and even the sediment grain is, is different. It's much finer here in the pool than over here in the flat areas. So we've got this micro niche habitat thing going on uh, during the summer. 
So this is a uh, photo from Google um, Google Maps, right? And so this is it, uh, it's a good example of, of this kind of sand movement. So here's the sandbar out here. That's way that's why the waves are breaking right there, right? Here's the shoreline. And so here are these troughs or runnels. And you can imagine that under he, underneath here, here, and here are those finger-like structures, right? They're welding towards the shoreline. So again, we've got these um, micro niches that occur on uh, this very near shore environment. So even though we think of sand bar, sandy beaches as being homogenous, right? It's just sand uh, for miles and miles. They're actually much more complex than, than we realize. A third component, not to make it more difficult, is the fact that the Oregon coast is divided on what are referred to as littoral cells. So these are um, stretches of sandy beach that are bordered by headlands. Um, and so, um, for example, where you guys are, um, that littoral cell is referred to as the Rockaway littoral cell. It goes from Cape Falcon to Cape Mears. This, uh, these uh, headlands stop sediment. Uh, so uh, as you know, during the winter, right, we have a majority of the winds that come from the south. And during the summer, we have the majority of the winds that come from the north. That means that um, during one part of the year, right, sediment is moved north. And then the next part of the year, the sediment is again returned south. And because of those headlands, the sediment doesn't leave your littoral cell. So you have what is referred to as a net zero loss because sediment is never lost from your littoral cell, right? So it moves north and south and also onshore and offshore. Big waves, it moves offshore. You might've noticed during the winter, especially right now, your beaches are really flat. The sediment has moved offshore. And then in the summer, the small waves are able to push it back on shore. So you don't lose sediment. But this is going to come into play because those big headlands, right, to get around them, you have to go into really deep water. Um, and a little fish, right, has to consider that really big water, really deep water, excuse me, has really big fish, right? So you don't want to encounter them because they're going to eat you. So. I've said that there's a lot of sandy beach, right? So a lot of people, what they say is, well, why do we have to worry about them? If there's that much beach, then even if we lose a couple, it's no big deal. So this is a, some work that uh, Omar De Feo from Uruguay put together with several of his collaborators and it looking at the different beach threats. And so you have the space um, on the x-axis. So um, the spatial variability in, this, in these threats versus time on the y-axis. And so, for example, a common beach threat is uh, R ROVs or ORVs, so the uh, vehicles, right, that are able to drive on the beach. They have a fairly small impact space-wise, right, because they you, you wouldn't travel very far. And the impact is, lasts for months to maybe a year, right? They kill inverts, things like that, but the inverts are going to come back. So pollution, nourishment, and grooming, for example, have a bigger impact both in time and, and space. The exploitation of resources, beach mining, um, bigger and bigger, uh, longer impacts. And then you have the big ones, uh, coastal engineering and urban development. So riprap, right, jetties, they're going to be there for centuries, right? And they're going to impact how water moves, how sediment moves, things like that. And if water can't move the same way, that means fish and the inverts that would have been moving that way are not able to. And <laughs> Overlaying everything, right, is the impending impacts of climate change and, of course, sea level rise. And sea level rise impacts all the beaches, right? So there is no escape from it. So even though we have a lot of beaches, climate change and the sea level rise and development are impacting all of them. So that's why we have to start thinking of them um, and thinking of how we conserve them. If we have to choose which ones to conserve, that's another decision to make, right? But we have to make that decision. And it's imperative to have the data and the knowledge before we make those decisions. That's We want to make a, a, a good decision. Um, and I threw in this figure just in case you found it interesting. Those threats have changed over time. Um, and not surprising, right? So you have year on the x-axis now um, and the intensity of coastal development on the y-axis. So in the, um, this, the year goes from the 1200s to the 2000s. So back in the 1200s, right, we have some small scale dune stabilization, especially in Europe, um, early protection structures, 
Um, and as we go along, we have larger scale dune stab stabilization um, in the 1900s, right? We start building jetties on our, on our estuary uh, mouths. We fill, fill in beaches, we uh, develop marinas, right? Our ROVs show up, um, bigger shore protection measures, and eventually people start traveling, right? Um, across countries to visit different beaches, right? If you've ever been able to, like, like the uh, mouth of the Columbia River, right? People come from all over the world. Um, same thing around San Francisco Bay, right? People come all over the world to visit these areas. So, uh, which is great, right? Um, we want this, it's important for tourism, for economy and so on, um, and for cultural exchange, but it comes with a price, of course. And one thing that I wanted to bring up because I don't feel like it's uh, mentioned enough is one more threat. And this is that climate change has also led to an increase in wave heights. Um, and this isn't talked too much about, but it's also um, that plus sea level rise, you can imagine how this could impact many of our beaches. So this is work that was done by Dr. Ruggiero, uh, who was based out of Newport. I'm not sure if he's still there, um, but he was looking at how waves have changed um, in the last three decades or so. So this is data that he published. You can see that on the x-axis, it goes from 1975 to 2010. Um, and this is significant wave height. So it's the largest waves um, during a certain period of time. And what you can see is that that significant wave height has increased over time. Um, and these are data that he took in the summer, which in when it, the smaller waves occur, right? At what is called buoy 46005. And um, I have a, a map for you. Um, so 46005 is this buoy that's 20 nautical miles off Northern Oregon. So this is particularly important for um, the Oregon coast. So sea level rise plus larger waves, right? How is that gonna impact our beaches? Um, and one of the things that uh, as we think of climate change for habitats, we think of some habitats are able to migrate inland, right? Um, the problem for our beaches and estuaries is that we have we, most of our coast and Northern California is the same way. We have a lot of um, mountains right behind them. Right, so there's nowhere to go for them. Um, sea level rise grows, that we basically just lose them all together. And that's uh, quite concerning. Um, the, the good thing is that we have a fair amount of data on how this, uh, these sandy beach threats are going to impact um, the fauna on the sand part of, of sandy beach surf zones. So these are data that were taken um, on, on shorebirds on the, in your left figure and on inverts on the right figure. And what they were looking at, they were comparing the density of shorebirds um, in control areas. So areas where they have no armoring um, on our beaches versus beaches where they, they have armoring. And over here, they were comparing inverts um, on beaches where there are ROVs driving around versus beaches where there are, uh, excuse me, where there are no uh, ROVs versus beaches where there are ROVs. And you can see that there's significantly different numbers, right? Much more birds and inverts in places where these threats are not um, observed. And there, this is not just for abundances, um, the number of species also decreases when they, we do encounter these threats. But what's interesting is we don't know that much about fish. Um, in our surf zones. We know a lot about what happens on the sand, right? It's very easy to walk along, right? With your scopes, you take a lot of data, you're able to um, get a good idea. Fish are much more difficult, right? Our, our surf zones are very dynamic. They're dangerous. I mean, uh, right, there's no other word. It makes very difficult work. And this is very common worldwide. Um, so this is, these are some data that uh, Jessica Miller out of Oregon State collected for a chapter we just published. Um, this is referred to as a heat map, um, and she was only able to find 124 studies. So what she did was she color coded it. So on this side, you have the different um, continents, um, and for and each column is on different information. So clams, inverts, fish, ichthyo, so all fit, like ichthyoplankton, excuse me, um, community structure, fish communities, early life history, and the benthos. And so this is color coded. And the color is different for each column. Um, and so basically the darkest color um, has this number of studies, the, the number that's on the top of each column. So for example, for the benthos, 
Europe had five studies. And what you can see is that for things like fish communities, we have nine total studies worldwide. So not a lot of work, not a lot of data to, to use um, and to get a good idea of what's going on. So this is what a little bit of what led me to uh, want to study this habitat. Coming from Ecuador, our beaches are much milder, much smaller waves, right? So um, we often um, are in the water in them. Um, and Ecuador is in the tropics, right? So the air is very warm, but the, so you want to get in the water to cool down. Um, it's very relaxing. Um, when I came here, slightly different, right? Having to buy a wetsuit um, and always having someone with a with a uh, cell phone in hand, just in case we have to call the Coast Guard to come rescue us kind of a thing. Um, but um, before we get into what we did, um, even though we don't know that much about surf zone fish, there is a little bit of data. So this is these are data uh, from a world review that was done by Dr. Old et al. and from Australia. And what he found from the literature was, was that these fish communities are very diverse and variable. So one day there, there's a lot of fish, tomorrow there are none. Um, but with that said, there's worldwide, there's 171 families that have been recorded. And on average, there's 33 species on, uh, on all beach. So a fair amount of species. But of those 33 on average, there, um, most of those are present in very low numbers. So uh, in, in most of those beaches, the 10 most abundant species made up 95% of all individuals. So there's a very few that are very dominant on those beaches. So this is a figure that they published and, and this kind of highlights what I just said. So this has relative abundance. So how abundant they are on the x-axis um, and the way to think about this because they're ranked is the lower the number, the higher the abundance. So these closer to one are the ones that were most abundant. And then frequency of occurrence on that y-axis, so how often they showed up, right? How many of 10 days if they showed up on nine, that's 90%. Um, and what you can see is most of the species, right, which are all these dots, appear very little, very, very, uh, not very often, very seldomly, right? Um, and of the few that are abundant, right? Very few also appear very often. So if we look at just these uh, dots that are on the top, right? There's very few dots. Um, it tells us a little bit of what the uh, most common families in surf zones are. Um, and this might not be surprising. Most of them are small fish. So mullets, herring, anchovies, uh, which are often referred to as forage fish, right? That serve as food for bigger uh, fish but also things like puffers, of course not here, right, but on uh, warmer waters, um, silver sides, uh, surf breams, um, and even pipefish, um, which are just out here, um, not very abundant, but fairly common, mostly because they're pushed out of the estuaries in, on eelgrass and things like that. So we do know a little bit about these fish um, and what families are present. So like I said, when I came here, I thought, this is cool. No one's done this, right? There's very little data. Let's do this. Let's try this. And so um, uh, Alan Shanks, who was my advisor, um, thought this was a great idea. So um, we were able to uh, gather a little bit of funding and a lot of volunteers, a lot of friends that helped out. And so we collected mostly inverts. I was happily an invert person and I wanted to study the inverts, the little mice and amphipods and bugs that swim around in the surf zone. But we were also interested in knowing who ate the bugs, right? And those would be the fish. And so the way that we collected the fish was using a beach seine, which is what you're seeing here. Um, this beach seine is 15 meters long, so about 45 feet long. It's not a very long beach seine um, because it's pulled very strongly by the surf, of course, so you don't want something too big. And so what we did was we walked into the shoreline, as you can see on the picture on the top left. Um, and then once we got to about uh, chest deep, we opened it in a V-shaped um, that was parallel to the shoreline. And then we walked backwards um, uh, back on shore. And so that's what you can see here. Um, we got really good at doing it really fast because you don't want to be out there with this. It's basically functioning as a sail, so it's pulling you out. Um, and you definitely don't want to be pulled out with, with this big sail. Uh, uh, and of course, we weren't strapped to it, so you could let go of it at any time. Um, and I like to tell these this to the folks just in case, I never lost a volunteer or a, a net in, my, in all my field work. So um, I feel like that's, that's 
that's brownie points right there, right? So this is how we caught fish. And I was just interested in what whatever fish were there, right? I wanted to see what was in their stomach so I could see who was eating my bugs. Um, so these are some of the species that we collected. Again, not too surprising, Pacific sardines, anchovy, smelt, um, yulicon, which was really interesting, right? Because they're highly endangered. Um, um, and then some of the other non-forage uh, non, uh, fish, uh, like surf perch, we caught a fair number of red tail and silver surf perch. And then staghorn sculpin um, and several flatfish, English sole and uh, starry flounder as well, um, which are more benthic, right? They like to burrow into the sediment, things like that. But what was really surprising was that we also caught almost 50 juvenile Chinook salmon. They were all fall Chinook. And the picture on the top right um, is uh, uh, one of the juveniles that we collected um, on one of those trips. So you can see it still has par marks and everything. So it's a, a fairly young, um, probably recently entered the marine habitat. And so these are data that I collected in the summer of 2006. Um, and so what you can see here is the month at which we collected. So July, August, and September. Um, and they were between the, the mean standard length is on the y-axis. And it went, and I don't know why this is flipped backwards, sorry, but from eight to 12 centimeters. So they were fairly small and mostly during the summer. So um, once I finished my master's, um, which uh, by the way, we published these data because um, it was pretty interesting and very few folks had known about this. Um, so um, we found it very interesting. And I don't need to tell you folks why Chinook salmon is important, right? Um, and just in case, um, Ankarinka Strawitia, I write it down because I, I can't spell it correctly. Um, I often make a mistake, so I, I like to write it down. But again, you already know they're economically, culturally, and ecologically important, right? Their uh, fisheries are massive, $50 million just in California, just on fall Chinook. Um, uh, culturally, they're very important to many Native American cultures, right? Uh, particularly those that uh, ha have inhabited coastal waters. And they move nutrients, right? They go out to the ocean, they grow really big, and they come back to rivers where they die after spawning. And those nutrients are then passed on to the freshwater, right, and terrestrial environments. So they have, they're particularly important. They're also widely distributed. Right, so they go from Southern California all the way up to Alaska and all the way on the other side of the, of the Pacific, um, Northern um, Asia and out to the Koreas as well. But they're also very diverse, right? They can be in, in fresh water when they're first hatched or born um, up to a year. Some actually don't go out to the ocean at all, right? They're landlocked. In the ocean, they can stay out for one year. They can stay out all the way up to five years. And then they can come back to fresh water during the winter, during the spring, during the fall, during the summer. They come, so basically anything you can think of, they can do. They're very diverse in their life history. So from all perspectives, they're really important and interesting because of, of, of how diverse they are. And that of course makes them very resilient. Now, as juvenile Chinook move out of their, their, their rivers and streams, right? They're, they have to go through multiple habitats, including estuaries before they can reach the open ocean. So this is a little cartoon that I made up to give you an idea of all of what they have to deal with as they move out. So in, uh, in, in black circles, you're gonna see little prey that are gonna show up as the fish pass by and try to eat them. And the predators are gonna show in, uh, in, in red circles, right? And so, as these little fish move out, um, because of the presence of predators or prey, they might take what are, we refer to as alternative migratory pathways, which leads them to use different habitats, right? Uh, because they use different habitats, their cohort, right, their, their school of fish separates in what is often referred to as split cohorts. And this means that some use one habitat, some others. Um, the, the habitats that are most important to them are referred to as nursery habitats. So for juvenile Chinook, those are the estuaries, right? We know they're very important. They eat a lot, they grow really large, um, and the bigger they are um, in the estuary, the more, the more likely they are to survive in the ocean. So estuaries, we know are their nursery habitats. But the question for us is, was 
are there alternative nursery habitats? And that's what we set out to test for sandy beach surf zones. But of course, how do you test the role of a, of, of a habitat, right? Are, is it just because they're present? Is it just because there's a lot of them? Um, is it because of what they're eating? Is it because of how they're growing? And so we looked at all of these uh, variables and then where we had data, we also compared it with estuaries. Um, and for this, we collaborated with uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, based out of ALSI and Coos Bay mostly. But um, in general, this, the agency was, was incredibly supportive and interested in, in our work. So first we set out to look at the distribution of these little fish on sandy beaches. We caught them um, for my master's project. I only looked at um, beaches that were around Coos Bay, uh, right? Because the, the, the marine lab of the University of Oregon is based out of Coos Bay and Charleston, in fact, the Oregon Institute of Marine um, Biology. And so the question was, is it just something that happens outside, outside of Coos Bay or is this something that occurs throughout the Oregon coast? So, and, and if not, what is it that uh, limits the distribution of these sandy beaches that these little fish are using? So because of that, we set out to determine this distribution. Um, and what we did is we sampled beaches that were very close to estuary mouths, right? Because that's where the juveniles are coming from. Um, and very distant beaches. So are they just hanging out very close to the mouth or are they actually you know, taking a risk and moving farther away? What is the size of the little fish and when are the beach, the, they're using the, the, the beach? And how does this vary um, annually, right? Was this just a fluke in 2006 or is this a common phenomenon? Um, and how many are using it? So we sampled from 2008 through 2010 um, from June 1st to September 30. I'm just going to show you a map with the locations of where we sampled. So in 2008, we sampled north and south of Coos Bay, Alsea Bay, and Tillamook Bay. So just south of where you guys are. Um, and those are near beaches or adjacent beaches, the ones that are just outside the estuary mouth. And we also sampled three distant beaches. And by that, I mean beaches are at least 15 kilometers away from an estuary. So a de fair decent, excuse me, a fair distance for fish that are only 10 centimeters long. In 2009, we reduced the numbers of, of beaches down south, but we extended to uh, beaches around the Columbia River mouth. 100 million smolts are released of, of Chinook salmon, of fall Chinook salmon are released in the Columbia. So we thought we could catch a fair amount of them on the beaches around that, those mouths. And then in 2010, we only sampled around Coos and Alsea Bay because we those were the beaches we, had, we wanted to really focus on to be able to then compare to the estuaries because the ODF and W was going to be sampling heavily inside the estuary as well. So what did we find? Um, so this time I'm going to color code the year. So uh, uh, black crosses are, are 2010, yellow crosses are 2009, and red crosses are 2008. Um, and so, for example, in 2009, we caught juvenile Chinook salmon on the north side of the Columbia River mouth, is what this is saying, right? So around Tillamook Bay, we sampled in 2008 and 2009, and we caught them on both sides in 2008 and on one side in 2009. Um, at Alsea Bay, we caught them on both sides, um, and in, on the south side in all three years we sampled. And on the Coos and around Coos Bay, we also caught them on all three years on the south side. And on the one year that we sampled on the north side, we also collected them. So this almost seemed like a done deal, right? These fish are just using the beaches that are just outside the estuary mouth, which makes a lot of sense, right? They don't want to take too big of a risk moving far away from this protected environment. The only thing is that we also caught fish at one beach, at one of these distant beaches. This is Horsefall. You might be aware, uh, uh, familiar with this beach, right? It's actually a fairly long beach that extends from uh, the mouth of the, of the bay all the way to lakeside, to one of these little uh, 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 lakes that uh, extends out, out here. So it's actually an extension of the beach that we sampled and that starts at the mouth of the of Coos Bay. But that kind of knocked out our, our um, our hypothesis that it was only these near, near or very adjacent beaches that these fish were using. 
And so here's just another way of looking at it, right? So we caught uh, juveniles on the north side of Columbia River, north and side of Tillamook Bay, north and south of Alsea Bay, but not on these two distant beaches, and north and, side, so north and so south side of Coos Bay, and one distant beach. So what is it about that distant beach, this horse fall, uh, that attracted the little juveniles? And so what we did was we overlaid the littoral cells, and that showed us a different story. So if you notice, all the um, collections were in beaches that are in littoral cells that have estuaries with Chinook salmon populations. So there can't be little juvenile Chinook here if there are no Chinook coming out of this mouth, basically, right? So you can see it here in Tillamook Bay, right? They have one littoral cell. They see it in Alsea Bay. And you can see the two distant beaches are in two littoral cells with no estuaries that have uh, Chinook salmon. And that explains why we caught fish in horsefall. It is within the same littoral cell of Coos Bay. So the fish are, were probably coming out of Coos Bay. We tested this hypothesis by running genetics. Um, so we had some collaborators uh, from NOAA who were um, uh, able to run the genetics. Um, they have a, a database, uh, a baseline data for the whole coast uh, all the way up to Alaska. So they're able to tell you the region of origin for the little fish. And what we found was that uh, uh, the fish were collected within the region of origin 92% of the time. So the majority of the fish were from that same littoral cell where we caught them. Not just because they were close, but they're, they're genetically from that, that little region. Um, but we did have a few, um, a few tourists. 2% had come from northern regions, 6% came from southern regions. So let's take a look at how big they were and when they were present. So again, we have time of year um, on the x-axis and the fork length on the y-axis. And so you can see that the fish were between eight centimeters and 12 centimeters um, in surf zones. And for the most part, between July the 1st and September the 1st. So we often joke that they, they're like tourists, right? They only come to the coast during the summertime. And you can see that the data is pretty much the same all three years. So this seems like a fairly common phenomenon. If you compare by beaches, um, you can see, so uh, now you have beach on the x-axis here and here. Um, you have catch on the in this y-axis and stomach fullness. So that's a measure of how full their stomachs are in relation to their body weight. And so what you can see, so CS is Coos, Coos Bay South, Tillamook is TN, uh, Tillamook North is TN, Alsea South, Coos South in 09, Tillamook North in 09, and Alsea South in 09. And the same thing is for stomach fullness on this side. And we found no difference um, in catch of these individuals or in the stomach fullness among beaches or among years. And that's because there was just a lot of variation, as you can see from the big air bars that I have on my, on my bars. But we found that we caught most of the fish around Coos Bay. In fact, on, on the beach south of the Coos Bay mouth, it's called Bassendorf, in case um, some of you happen to have been by there. So we did a back of the envelope type analysis. Um, and what we calculated was between 0.3 and 10% of all the juvenile of the fall juvenile Chinook salmon that come out of Coos Bay are probably using sandy beaches. So it's not a big group, but it is a, a fairly significant number of little, little fish. We also were curious about these troughs and how those might be attracting more fish than the flat areas. And we actually found some significant differences. So now we have troughs, so the pools versus the flat areas on the x-axis here, and the catch on one y-axis and the stomach fullness on your figure on your right. And as you can see, we found more fish in the trough areas with fuller stomachs than in the flat areas. So that's pretty cool because it says that the fish are um, very variable in space and time, but in general, we catch them more often in the troughs than in the flat areas. And this also ex helps us explain um, let me step back a little bit, why we did not catch any fish on the south side of the Columbia River mouth. 
right? That's the only near shore, near, uh, adjacent beach where we didn't catch any juveniles. If you've ever been there, this is an awesome razor clam beach. By the way, you can get your limit in like 10 minutes. It is just awesome. I love razor clams. Um, but you may have noticed that this is because this beach is incredibly stable. You have no troughs. It looks like it has to do with the jetty that doesn't allow for the sediment to move. And so the lack of troughs might be what's keeping the juveniles from coming into this beach. Or at least that's what we are hypothesizing. Okay, so what were the little juveniles eating um, while they were on this beach? Um, in Coos and Alsi South, they were mostly eating Jassa, which is a, a, a small amphipod, this guy. Um, if you work in estuaries, you might have heard that they eat a lot of corophium, very similar group of, of amphipods. In Tillamook, they were eating a lot of mice in 08. And these are these little uh, shrimp-like uh, crustaceans. If you go to the beach and you walk all the way to the shore as the water comes, uh, washes in and out, you might see a bunch of little things that are just swarming on the sandy beach. Those are mice. They're not actually shrimp. They're, they're um, pericards, they're called, um, and, which is a big group that groups um, amphipods and isopods as well. So again, in Coos South and Halsey South, again, those same little uh, jassa, those little amphipods. And in Tillamook North in 09, they actually started eating a different group. This is um, um, insects. So um, Coos and Halsey seem to have very similar diet. Tillamook, slightly different diet. Mice and insects seem to be very important there. When we compared the trough versus the flat area, we also saw differences. So now you have trough and flat on the bottom on the x-axis and the number of these uh, items on the y-axis. And what we found fairly different things. In the troughs, lots of insects. And this makes sense, right? It's water that's going in circles. So it's concentrating those dead insects for the little fish to eat. But in the flat areas, the fish were eating more fish, especially it looks like juvenile anchovy. Very important because they have a lot of energy, right? It allows the fish to grow uh, bigger. And then also in troughs, they seem to encounter a lot of cancer magister megalope and, um, and zoea. So lots of little crab, a baby crab is basically in the flat areas. So different diets in these both regions. Okay, so we now know that they are present uh, mostly in adjacent beaches, but only if they are present in um, littoral cells with um, Chinook inhabited estuaries. They're mostly there during the summer, right? And they're uh, of between eight and 12 centimeters where they're eating a fairly diverse diet. How is this different from estuaries, um, right? The nursery habitat, how important are they really as a habitat? So what we decided to do was to look at the migration patterns and compare catch, diet, and growth in, in surf zones versus estuaries. We only did this in two areas, um, Alsi Bay and Coos Bay. So we compared uh, the beach that's just south of the Coos Bay mouth um, with uh, data from inside the estuary and the same thing for Alsi Bay and Alsi Surf, which is what we call. Again, um, CDFW did all the sampling inside the estuary. To look at migration patterns and growth rates, we use otoliths. Um, and if you're not familiar with uh, otoliths, they are um, the inner, uh, inner ear bones. So you may have, uh, I'm sure you've noticed fish have no outer ears, right? They have um, no external ears, but they are, they are able to hear. Um, and they do this by allowing the vibrations of sound to hit uh, things like their otoliths. And the otolith then transmits that sound to their brains. They actually have three pairs of otoliths in total, but we use the biggest one, which is called a sagita. And so you can see on the left side, um, Londi Tamara, which was a grad student of, of Jessica's too, she's extracting an otolith. And you can see it, it's a very small, right? It's this white little thing um, that, uh, that she's extracting. The cool thing about otoliths is that they lay rings as you can see on this figure, right, they're analogous to trees and tree rings. So by counting the number of rings, we know how old the fish is. If it's a very old fish, we count in years. If it's a fairly young fish, we count in days. So for the juveniles, we had an idea of how old the fish are in days. Besides putting a ring, 
they're also incorporating certain elements from the water column. Um, and so if the fish happen to move from one area where they have a lot of, say, gold in the water column, I'm making it up because gold is usually not something we look for, but say they move from the fresh water, there's a ton of gold. So in their otolith, in those rings that they were laying at the time, they would show a lot of gold, right? If they move out into the ocean where there's very little gold, the rings that were laid during the ocean time would show very little gold. So if you're able to measure those elements, you could tell, right? And since you can count the number of rings, you can say, okay, on day 20, they moved out of the freshwater to marine waters because I see a drop in the amount of gold in their oils. So that's what we did. Um, we used uh, what is called laser, laser ablation uh, plasma. Anyways, it's a very long uh, acronym. We just call it a laser because it sounds cooler, makes it sound cooler to others who don't know that it's a very nerdy laser that uh, is inside an office, right? And we spend days and days and days without sleeping to be able to run as many samples as we can because they're very expensive to use. Half a million dollar equipment, right? They charge us by the day. So you don't sleep, you run all of them in 24 hours if possible. So anyways, what we do is we run a, um, a transect from one side of the otolith, as you can see in this arrow, all the way to the other through the core. So just to give you um, a, an idea of how to read these data, right? The core is when uh, was laid when the baby fish is hatched, right? And as they grow bigger, um, the, the rings closer to the edge are from when they were collected, right? So you basically have a mirror image, right? So whether you look this way or uh, that way, it's a mirror image of each side. So that's what you can see in this figure, right? So this is an element, um, any element, this is just an example, right? Um, and this is how it should look if that element happens to be very high um, at the time of collection versus at the time of hatch. In the case of, uh, of, of juvenile Chinook, we often look for strontium and barium. Um, strontium, for example, is very low in freshwater, which is what you see here in the core, very high in the ocean. So by this, uh, uh, this curve, we have an idea of when the fish left freshwater and entered the marine environment. And we have double data, right? Because we have it on one side and on the other side. So if one side is not very clear, we have the other side to back us up. So that's when we have an idea of if they've entered marine water. And to be honest, we can't tell between brackish, so between estuary water and ocean water. So we only know if they entered some form of saline water. And then we're able to if we know exactly when um, they entered marine water, we're able to say, okay, these are the rings that are, were laid during their marine time. So this is how, um, how many days they've spent in marine waters. And also because um, the, the width of the ring um, is related to how fast they were growing. So if we know that these were laid in the marine, we know how fast they were growing in, that, in those waters. So lots of data we can extract out of otoliths, but you can imagine very tedious work. Um, this is not the otolith itself, this is polished. So we use like sandpaper basically. It's, it's not sandpaper, it's, it's very uh, fine sandpaper, but you can imagine someone just polishing these very little bones until you have a very thin strip of it so that you could read it and then run the laser on. So uh, very time consuming. So we then sampled um, calculated growth, um, and that's basically a relationship with between how long the fish is and how wide their otoliths are. Um, and so by developing this relationship, right, so here you have otolith width between fork length, you develop a regression, a linear regression, and using that regression, you're able to estimate growth. So you have an idea of how much the fish grew. And I won't go into too much detail, but I'm happy to talk about this more um, if folks are curious about this, right? So what we did was we calculated the uh, growth the last 14 days of life because we found that they had been present in, in marine waters uh, between 14 and 30 days. So we just wanted to capture the growth in the marine waters so that we can compare estuaries versus the surf zone. Okay, so sorry, I went into a bit of detail, but here are what we actually found. So we found, we had data for 
Coos, um, Estuary, and Surf Zone for 08, 09, and, uh, and 10. And that's what you can see on this top uh, axis. And so what I'm gonna show you is the day uh, of the year when they were captured versus the fork length. So that's for Coos, and this is for ALSI. And you can see that Surf Zone data are in open circles, Estuary data in closed circles. So, um, uh, and, and all the, the six, uh, uh, figures. You notice that in 09, we had very few fish in the surf zone and also in, in 2010 at ALSI South. So to not bias the sampling, the, the analysis, we decided not to use those data and only focus on 2008 in both habitats and 2010 at Coos. And what we found um, was that the size at capture of the fish were not different between estuaries and surf zones. They were of similar size. So juveniles collected in estuaries and surf zones presented similar size at capture, suggesting that it's the same group of fish that are using both. So let's look at the size at marine entrance, right? So that, this is where the laser da da data come in. Um, and again, um, this now you have coos right on top, 08, 09, and 10. Um, you have surf data in gray bars, estuarine data in black bars. This is for ALSI Bay. And again, very few fish in 09 and in, at ALSI in 10. So we excluded those data to not bias. And when we compared these three uh, figures, we found that the juveniles collected in estuaries and surf zones presented similar sizes at marine entrance. So they were coming in at similar sizes and they were caught at similar sizes looking pretty good so far. So then how long had they been in the marine uh, uh, environment? So this figures, these figures are gonna be a little different. So uh, let me just orient you. So you're gonna have day of year on the x-axis again, but now there's really no y-axis. And I'll explain why in a second, right? The, um, uh, you have surf zone data in the blue dashed bars and estuarine data in the red uh, continuous lines. Each line represents one fish. So here you have like 15 fish in total. The beginning of the line represents the day of marine entrance. So when did the laser tell us they had come into the marine water? So in this case, it was like May 15. The end of the day of the line represents the day at which we captured it. So for example, in this blue line, it would be like June 1st. And so the length of the line represents how long the fish had lived in the marine environment. So it's, it's a fairly nice graphical way of showing when they entered and when we caught them to get an idea of how long they had been, who entered first, who entered last, that sort of thing. So here's all of our data. Um, so you can see that fish came in at different times of the, of the summer, right? Um, anywhere between May 1st or so, all the way into um, early July. Again, we had more data from 08 and, um, and 2010 in Coos Bay. So those are the data that we looked at. And this time what we found was that in 08, the estuarine fish had entered marine waters earlier than surf zones. So they were coming in at the same size, but the estuarine fish had come in earlier than surf zones. And this was significant statistically but we found no difference in 2010. We're not sure why that year was different, but at least in, in two out of the three years, estuarine fish had entered the marine waters earlier than surf zone fish. So that's what um, we concluded. So just a little more data, just to finish up the, the comparisons, right? This is catch data in surf zones and estuaries, right? So you have a year now on the x-axis, 08, 09, and 10. Um, Coos on the top, ALSI on the bottom. Um, surf zone data on the open axis, estuarine data on the, on the, on the dark bars. Um, and in general, estuaries had much higher catches than surf zone data. And it might be confusing that this bar seems to be smaller than this white bar, and that's because I have two different y-axis. So these, these are for only for estuarine data, Notice that the axis goes up to 10 in surf zones, goes up to 100 in, in estuaries. So that's why it might look a little confusing. But even with that, notice that the bars are still much bigger in estuaries than in surf zones. So 
the, the fish are using asteroids more than surf zones. And that makes sense, right? It is the nursery habitat after all. So significantly higher catches in asteroids than in surf zones. But how is, is the diet comparing? So on the left, we have numerical percentage of their diet in surf zones on the right from the asteroids. They were both, in both cases, in both habitats, mostly eating amphipods, slightly different species, but amphipods nonetheless. Also lots of little megalope, mostly crab megalope, but also a few other species. Um, notice that though more megalope in estuaries than in surf zones, 15 versus 5%. Insects were also part of the diet in both habitats, but much more in um, surf zones than in estuaries. And then there are certain things that were only uh, observed in one habitat. Mice, for example, only in surf zones, fish, and isopods. This is the little uh, pill, pill bugs that you might have noticed on, on in surf zones. Also, you may find them on, uh, on underneath your pot, pots, for example. In estuaries, Cumations, lots of these little buggers um, in their stomachs. So some similarities, some differences between the habitats. And how does that mean for stomach fullness? So again, you have year on the access, coos on top, policy on the bottom, uh, surf data on the gray bars, uh, estuarine data on the black bars. And you have stomach fullness on the y-axis. Notice that it's the same y-axis and this time, um, again, just using the three comparisons where we had enough data, we found no significant difference in the stomach fullness from estuarine and surf zone fish. So they're more abundant in estuaries, but they're eating the same amount and a similar diet in both habitats. So how does that, the, the end part of eating, right? Eating is great, but it doesn't mean anything if they don't grow, right? That's what the fish are trying to do. They're trying to maximize growth. If they're bigger, they're able to survive at a higher rate. So what, how did we look? Let's take a look at growth now. Again, year on x-axis, now you have growth rates on the y-axis, and this is millimeters per day. Um, gray bars are for surf zone data, uh, and black bars are for estuaries. Um, on average, the fish were growing 0.5 millimeters per day. So half a millimeter, pretty fast for fish, right? Not surprising, these are ocean waters uh, or, or marine waters where fish tend to grow faster. But again, like with stomach fullness, we found similar growth rates between estuaries and surf zones in all three comparisons, suggesting that they're more abundant in estuaries, but they're eating about the same amount in both habitats and they're growing about the same amount, which is really interesting because you would have thought surf zones are more dynamic, they should need more energy, right? Expend more energy to be able to stay in there. And yet they seem to be eating as much and growing as much, which is really good uh, for these habitats. So starting to wrap up, and I'm sorry, I tend to go on about surf zones. Um, I, 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 uh, I really enjoy talking about them, even though it's not the only work that we do anymore. But just to give you a summary, right? There is much higher catches in estuaries than in surf zones of juvenile Chinook salmon, but the size of capture and the size and residence in marine waters are uh, approximately the same. The day of marine uh, water entrance seems to be earlier for 2008, um, if, excuse me, seems to be earlier for estuaries um, than surf zones, at least for 2008. Um, in both habitats, they seem to be preying on similar groups. Uh, um, and at a similar rate, right? Their stomach fullness is about the same. And finally, their growth rates are very similar. So what do we conclude from this? It concludes that, um, and as we thought, right, it's a small number of Chinook salmon individuals that are actually using surf zones during the summer. It's suggesting that it's at the moment of coming down from the river to the estuary, some are staying in the estuaries, and some are continuing on to surf zones, suggesting that the cohorts are spatially splitting. And it's looking like the first, the, of, of all the fish that are coming down, the first ones to get to the estuary, they get the best spots, they stay in the estuary. It's the ones that are coming down later on, right? All the, the rooms are full, all the seats are full, right? They have no spot for them. So they're the ones that are making the extra effort going out into the surf zone. Um, the way that uh, Bob Buckman from CDF uh, ODF and W thinks about it is it's almost as surf zones are serving as an extension of the estuary. 
And so what, what it suggests is that surf zones are not a nursery habitat, right? They're not the primary, they're an alternative nursery habitat. So when there's too many fish in the estuary, the, these habitats serve as the alternative. This is the next best thing for them. So just because I, uh, Alan actually is the one who got me into the little cartoons, here's a cartoon that hopefully will help bring all those points home. So as little Chinook salmon, right, migrating down the stream, the first one take up the good spots in the estuary, the later ones are the ones that have to go out into the surf zones. Here though, they're able to eat at um, similar prey items um, where they're able to grow at similar rates. In surf zones, their numbers and their distribution are influenced by that sand that moves onshore, right, in the form of troughs, and um, by the presence of headlands, right, that impede their movement uh, north and south uh, along the coast. Okay. With that, I'd like to thank you for inviting me, Zach, um, and for the uh, for you folks for for listening to me uh, blabber on about sandy beaches. Um, and I, uh, this is a, an old slide that I just brought up because I really like it. This is a, the thank you that I a slide that I had for my uh, PhD dissertation defense. Um, on the left side, you see a lot of folks that helped us sample. Um, we actually uh, connected with a county um, program that uh, hired at youth risk during the summer. And so they gave me a, a, a platoon of these uh, folks, which were awesome kids to work with. Um, and so they did a lot of the heavy lifting for us. And so you can see them all uh, on here. And on the right side, uh, my family um, and uh, many other people that I met uh, while doing uh, this work in, uh, in Newport in particular, um, we were big on soccer down there. So anyways, um, I hope I haven't bugged you too much, but uh, oh, of course, funding sources on the way bottom in case you're wondering who um, was interested in funding this kind of work. With that, I'd be, um, if there's any time or if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take a, a crack at answering some of them. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much. That was really great. I don't know if, you know, you, you were looking at the little icons, but I, I kept grinning and nodding my head a whole bunch being like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> um, I have a question, which is, is there any, um, cause you said that the, 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 I forget what you called each, each of those units that were along the shore. Um, the littoral cells? Littoral cells, yeah. So, you were finding that the fish were moving within littoral cells. Do you, is there a decrease in productivity as you move further away from the mouth of a major river within those littoral cells that would make them want to use certain parts of the beach more than others? Is that? So I think it's mostly just about risk, right? The farther away you are, uh, the more risk you encounter. Um, and to get around the headlands, right, which is the limit of each of these littoral cells, they yeah. have to go into fairly deep waters, right? And bigger waters means bigger fish, more predators to encounter. So I think it has more to do with risk than anything else. Um, and they just want to limit it until they're big enough, right? Until they have to leave at the end of the summer, which is looks like by September the 1st, waves are too big, right? Um, and the, the community, as the you know, winds die down, uh, the upwelling winds die down, there's just less nutrients to go around. It's time for them to move um, at least off of northern and central Oregon, right? They're going to make it all the way up to Alaska. So they got a fair while to go um, after that. But yeah. Yeah. Um, we got a question here in the chat. When do the juveniles leave the surf zones in estuaries? So historically um it is thought that juveniles were continuously migrating out of uh, uh, streams and estuaries right uh, we now think of them as a group of a, a cohort that moves all at the same time historically that was probably not what was happening right it was continuous movement throughout the year probably especially in the bigger rivers in Colombia and stuff like that um with the rise of hatcheries right we've kind of domesticated them into right it's only when we release them that they are able to move out um but now it's mostly a summer thing, especially for the fall chinook, which are much more common um, south of, uh, of, uh, of Washington. 
no, south of Canada, excuse me. Um, and so um, they're mostly in our estuaries and surf zones during the summertime. Come September the 1st, September 15th, really big waves, right? Hit our coast, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the big storms come, start coming rolling in. Um, I think it's not a good habitat for them to be there anymore. So I think that marks the end of their, their stay. Cool. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, folks can feel free to, to pipe up with any more questions they might have. Um, shoot, I had like a dozen over the course of it, but should have written them down. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy to, um, if you want to share my contact information, I'm happy to answer emails later too. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Some, um, something I, I don't, I don't, I didn't really have time to add, but now, so we have been sampling sandy beaches now in Northern California. Um, we sample from the, the Oregon border all the way to Marin County, which is just north of San Francisco Bay. Um, and we have not call, caught a single juvenile Chinook. Interesting. Yep. It looks like, yep. That does kind of lead me to, I, I remembered one of my questions. Um, the years that you excluded in, in certain locations, right? Did you look at their particular escapement in those hmm. um, years? That's a really good question. The problem with our, at least they were back then, it was really difficult to get escapement data. Yeah, um, yeah. There are just not that much. And, and part of it is just, it's really hard. It's, it's really rural areas, right? It's really um, the sticks kind of a thing. And so, so it, it was really different. And Coos is a fairly big watershed. Um, and so we had data from, uh, from the hatcheries and the numbers that were returning to them but we didn't have any uh, wild fish data or very little wild fish data. And then ALSI doesn't have any uh, hatcheries, right? And so it's all wild fish. So it was even harder to get any data there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the thought in coups at least was that most of the production was hatchery based and they were pumping out about the same number every year. Um, so there was something going on in 2009 that uh, in our, our hypothesis is that they were, they were, um, the conditions were good enough in the estuaries that basically there were space for everyone that was coming down. That makes sense. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it was fairly weird. It was, um, it was very, it was a tough year because, you know, we're out there, it's hard work, water's cold, and we catch so few of these fish. Um, yeah, it was tough. Um, we got another one in the chat here asking if you found uh, coho out in the in the surf at all we we only caught so this is embarrassing we caught one and i didn't realize it was a coho um it was only until we ran genetics on it that they came back and said yeah that's not a chinook that's a coho and i was like oh sure the marks the the par marks were completely different and yeah i just you know after catching hundreds of chinook i didn't expect one coho um Huh. That, that one was caught early in the season. Actually, that should have been a red flag. It was earlier than we usually start catching them. So um, that explains why it was a little co. And it was small. It was like the size of a Chinook, uh, a fall Chinook, which usually coho, you think of them as bigger when they come out. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, they don't. I haven't heard about, you know, I mean, I, I hadn't heard about Chinook using the, uh, the the surf either until I read your paper, but um, I haven't heard I haven't heard at all about coho using using the surf. So yeah, I think yeah. it's very rare. Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, oh, we have um, another question here in the chat. Where do the Chinook migrate to? Sure. So they're coming out of the rivers and streams, right, uh, through the estuaries out to the uh, um, coastal ocean for the summer. And then they move up to, uh, they'll migrate along the coast all the way to Alaska. Um, um, interestingly, each population seems to have their specific spot. And they go back year after year after year. They're fairly, uh, 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 fairly um, stable. Um, and then, you know, they'll stay out there for a year to five and then make the trek all the way back. 
pretty amazing if you think about it. It really is. Um, there's uh -huh. a question about the size of uh, Chinook being caught in the Tillamook area. In the 70s, the Chinook were caught, the, the caught were uh, in the 40 pound range. And now they're much smaller in, in kind of more the 20 pound range and wondering why that might be. Yeah. So you, I'm sure you've all heard of natural selection, right? That's the just the nature eliminating the weaker genes, so to speak, and allowing only the stronger genes to survive. Um, humans, because of how, um, how many there are of us, right, and our technology and everything, we now have what is called anthropogenic selection. So we put a different type of pressure, a, a selective pressure on them. Um, and one way we do this is through fishing. By us eliminating all the biggest fish, we only leave the genes of the smallest fish. And so um, that's one way that we have affected their populations, which is one of the reasons the size of the fish of fisheries tends to be smaller with time. Um, there's a second part to that is that as fish, our fish basically sense risk, like we were talking about before. And one of the risks is if you go off to the ocean, right, it's a very long track. And on the way back, and if you're there for multiple years, um, a way of reducing risk is to just come back smaller and earlier. So that's something else that salmon have been found to be doing is that instead of going out for two, three years is what Chinook usually went for. Now they're re coming back and maybe just over the winter and they come back right, right back, right? So they're not even making it to Alaska. They're just coming out to the coastal ocean, eating, growing a little bit and coming back. So um, they're, they call them what half pounders or um, they also call them jacks, right? When they come back really early. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that seems that the percentage of fish that are doing that seems to be increasing. Um, and it's partly because the risk is so high, right? There's so much fishing going on. There's also so many predators. It's just not worth the risk. Um, because in the end, the fish, what they want to do is pass on their genes. And they can't pass on their genes if they don't spawn, right? And they only do that in the rivers. So um, even though they're better suited, right, to go out and stay out for three, four years, it's the risk is lower to stay close and come back faster and therefore smaller. So there's there's multiple components going on, um, as, as at least is what the literature uh, suggests um, for their size. That's a very good question. Um, there were a lot of jacks this year. Does that have a meaning for the following year return? Um, so the several management groups and uh, depending on where you are on the coasts, a lot of uh, a lot of management decisions are based on the number of jacks returning. So there's the the assumption is that when there's a lot of jacks, you could expect a lot of the three year olds and, and so on coming back um, in in two years, right? Because jacks come back the next year, so two years later is when the big fish come back. So it's that's a good good news. Um, twenty twenty one was a good ocean year, um, and twenty twenty two is expected to be okay too. So it might mean that a lot of the little fish survived, and that's why we had a lot of jacks coming back, which should mean that a lot of fish will come back in two more years. Yeah, so it's it is definitely good news, Sweet. or at least we think it's good news. Every time we say something definitive, the mother nature just kind of slaps us in the face and does something different. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we had a we had a good in-stream year for uh for spawning for for coho this year because we had a lot of water this fall winter. Yeah. So it's been dry January, but you know, the spawning season there was a, there was a lot of water, so Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we're in, we're a little bit in trouble because our steelhead is coming back and it comes back yeah. now and they're looking for that water and they you know, they came in with the December rains and then no rain, and so we're we're a little concerned for them, but we'll see how it goes. Similar concerns up here, you know. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, thank you again thank for inviting me. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure to have you, Jose. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was. 
I was so excited to get you to come in and talk about that paper because, or that that that's that body of work because, um, like I said I read it and got really excited about it. So <laughs> great, thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you so very much. And yeah, um, yeah folks, uh, keep in touch and keep an eye out for our announcements about uh, our next speaker series in March. Um, it should be about alders, uh, which would be pretty interesting. Right. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a great evening and uh, we'll sign off. Yep.